Welcome to Wednesday night online Bible study in our Facebook group for October, sorry, apparently I can't get my own straight, for November 18th, 2020. We're continuing discussion of inspiration and I would hope we get all the way through 1 Corinthians 7 tonight, but looking through my notes, I don't think that's going to happen, so we may be pushing this back another week or two, so just so you're aware. But if you want to look at the passages, we'll to give you a good idea of where we're going, inspiration talk. It's 1 Corinthians 7 and 1 Corinthians 11. And if you're familiar with both of those texts, you know, those are the ones, those are one of those we don't like to really preach about and talk about because there's too much stuff there we don't really like or we're too boisterous about. And I will propose for you in this discussion that that's because we lack a solid view of inspiration. Okay, let me just remind you where we're going, how we're getting there, and make sure I clear up just one thing that I may not have been clear on in the discussion of inerrance or infallible when we get to that point. I'm going to read you the same Shauna Wendy story I read last week because this discussion of the biblical text being inspired is not some academic exercise. This goes on in some form in the, in the West all the time when we talk about our faith. As I preached a little bit Sunday about, we have made our faith about what we believe rather than who we believe. And so we have to believe just these exact right things. If you don't believe the exact right things, it's a problem. So this may seem like an academic exercise, and why don't we get to real Bible study, but if you can't do this, you're going to have a hard time doing real Bible study and pulling out the meanings and being the Hermes and pulling out the meaning. Okay, now that I've ranted about that long enough, let me just read the story I read to you last week, which is from across the spectrum. Shauna, a sophomore physics major at a state university, has been building a relationship with her roommate, Wendy. As the relationship has developed, she has found opportunities to share her faith in Jesus. Wendy, a history major, has been showing interest in spiritual things. One day, things take a challenging turn, and after listening to a lecture on ancient historiography in which the New Testament Gospels were used as an example, Wendy returned to her room and posed a series of troubling questions to Shauna. Why is the fourth Gospel record of Jesus' words and deeds so unlike the other three? Why do various Gospel accounts of Jesus' resurrection differ in their details? Is the Bible really historically reliable? Historical Christianity has always claimed the Bible is a trustworthy written word of God. But how can we be sure of this? Well, I just believe it. Great. I'm glad that works for you. I'm glad that makes you feel comfortable. I'm glad of that. But if you've listened to me preach anything in the last 10 years of returning to ministry, you know that I think that's good for you but you are pushing people away with just, well, I just believe the Bible. Good. Why? And what does it mean when you say the Bible is the inspired word of God? Let me just review what we've covered before. Evangelicals, however vaguely you determine that, because many people who function in American Baptist life would be uncomfortable being called evangelicals simply because of the negatives that have come from the medias of being evangelical, especially if you look like me with white skin and gray hair. It says, we believe the biblical books are God's word. If you really are interested in a breakdown of how books got in the biblical text and how books didn't get in the biblical text, and why I have commentaries in my office for biblical books that are not included in the biblical canon, we can do that. You can leave that in the comments, and we'll spend a week or two on that so we don't bore people to tears, but we can do that. But really, this became an issue in the 1970s, and this became a battleground in which many of us lost jobs, many of us lost lots of things because we weren't willing to go along with the company line of inerrancy. Everything in the Bible is completely, totally this way. Now, and a person who takes the inerrant perspective, which is the predominant perspective of predominantly fundamentalist or conservative theological groups, would say inerrancy, by definition, everything in the biblical text is accurate completely, including scientific data and historical data. Infall an infallible list, I can't even say that word, 
would say the biblical text read as they were intended will not lead us astray and cause us to make any error. I would like to clarify one detail that I probably didn't cover because it's a soapbox of mine and I tried to skip over it. Even in an errant person who believes in complete biblical inerrancy, it tells us all the history and the world's got to, earth's got to be 6,000 years old and all these things would say this. Do not try to hold the Old Testament and the New Testament to the same precision standards we have in this time period. As you've heard me say many times, they round things up. They discuss things in vague ways. They claim to be a certain person when they're not. That was not culturally unacceptable in their time. The book of Isaiah, well, an an Aaronist might disagree with this. The book of Isaiah was written over three different time periods. No one argues it was written over two different time periods. And each claiming to be Isaiah. That was not plagiarism back then. That was showing respect. As you've heard me say many times, the children of Israel did not wander in the wilderness according to the biblical text and based on extra biblical material for 40 years. It was 38.6 years. Now there's some details and you can fudge it to 40 if you want to. They didn't care about that precision. You may need to know that this happened at this time on this date in this place. The biblical writers did not care. So even an inerrant person would say, we're not fighting that battle about the biblical text. That's not important. That was not its intention. So I just want to make sure I properly present their view. They're not trying to say every little detail is exactly this way with the same precision we use today. Okay, here are the questions I left you with last week. Is all of what we know of the Bible inspired? I mean, that's what we say, right? And I'm not trying to refute that. I'm just trying to point out that's what we say, right? So what does that really mean? Is it all equally inspired? I'm going to argue that yes, it is, but is it all equally inspired? Is it all inspired the same way? And I'm going to argue no, it is not. And if you do not understand that, you miss some of the nuances of what's going on. Related to that is, is it all equally edifying for us today? Is all the biblical text equally edifying for us today? And I know I've said this in groups here and it horrifies people until I explain it. No. If you don't understand that, go read the Levitical laws. Go read a section in the Song of Songs or Ecclesiastes. And then contrast that with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount or Jesus' Greatest Commandment. They're both inspired, but they're not equally edifying, which leads to the follow-up question, are they equally edifying for us today? My classic example I always use is the book of Matthew opens with a genealogy. You probably have rarely read it, rarely come to it. I, quite frankly, find very little edifying to me, even though I can explain to you each section and how it got there. But if you were a Jewish male who the book of Matthew was written to, that would be your, you'd be like, oh, I get this. I get what you're saying. This makes perfect sense, Matthew. But it doesn't convey the same edifying ways for us because times change, and the farther we get away from when the text was originally written, the more issues we might have with that. Just a few phrases I want to make sure you get So I've typed them all out. It is important for us to realize our attitude of trust is not some theory about how God inspired Scripture. God never gave us an inspired theory of Scripture. Now you may think, well, I've read in Scripture this, and you read 2 Peter last week. Yeah, I did. 2 Peter tells us that God moved the humans. (laughs) What does that mean? Don't apply into what you think it means or what someone told you it means. What was it logically would it mean? My next phrase is, for example, nowhere do the scriptural authors anywhere demonstrate any concern with the issue of how much control God exerted over the writers of biblical books. And they show no concern about how limited cultural bound perspective God left intact. For example, let's just pick something simple that I, I struggle with just from a perspective, but... This is the way it is. How come in the biblical text, in the Old Testament text, there's talk about taking more than one wife? Did God always allow that? Or was that a cultural factor 
that based on the people were not ready to make an adjustment that God simply allowed. These are things you need to think of when you're reading the biblical text. Well, why does God allow this? It might be important when you get to chap- we get to chapter 11, if we ever get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay, before I do this, I want to make sure we're, we're all clear in this next text. I'm going to give you classic examples from three of the Gospels. We call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I want to make sure we understand the details before we get there. In the three texts I'm about to show you, the Greek text is not in doubt. So I can grab my Greek New Testament and I can look down at the bottom and I can see that basically there is no doubt with all these little words and cheat sheets that I have here. There is no doubt that this is the Greek text as best we can tell using any historical method from any scholar, whether a theologian or not. There are very, very few in these examples that I'm going to give you textual variations that may be a word you're not familiar with. New Testament is written in Greek. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell reading, a, reading a, a Greek letter as it's been copied through the years. For example, let's just pick something controversial I'm sure we'll come up at some point. It is equally valid to translate the number in the book of Revelation 666 as 616 because of the variations. So once again, when you build a theology around something that has a textual variation, that might not be a good plan. That has not occurred today in these gospel passages. All three of these gospel passages, it's very important for the author who's writing it, where they place it in the, in the narrative and how they tell the story because they are t- conveying something very important in a theme. Matthew is trying to show Jesus as the new Moses. Luke is trying to show him you know, as, as the great physician and the healer and all these things. And Mark is just trying to get the details in so we can see that we can glory in the resurrection. Scholars across the spectrum agree that the three, de- three narratives we're going to talk about today are exactly the same event. No one argues this. It's not like, oh, this happened here and then six months later this happened and three months later. No. No one disagrees. And just to let you know, in the world of theological scholars, when we can agree on stuff, and I lump myself in, when real theological scholars can agree on stuff, it's amazing. It's not in dispute. Let me just read these texts as they are written in the New International Version. Um, Matthew 9, I'm sorry, Matthew 10, verses 9 and 10. So he's commissioning the 70 or the 72, once again, textual variation. He's commissioning them to go out. It says, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Now, those seem like very specific details. And in Matthew's gospel, there's been great events that have occurred. You can read about them in Matthew chapter 9. And they are sending them out. He is sending out people to clear the way, to clear the path, to be his messengers, to speak his truth, to be his witnesses. It's very specific details. No bag for the journey, or extra shirt, or sandals, or a staff. And don't take any money with you, probably because maybe you go on the road to Jericho, we learn in Luke, and that's a bad idea. Okay, here's Luke's version. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But Matthew said that... Huh. Okay, just wondering. It seems like there's some issue with the staff. No bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Okay. Then we have Mark's version. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. Hold on. Hold. No staff? Maybe a staff? These are the pivotal pivotal events that are occurring here. And the writer wants to get this straight. I'd also like to point out there's no bread, no bag, no money in Mark's version, but wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Hmm. So there's confusion. Did they want to need a staff? Not need a staff? 
Wouldn't it be important that Matthew would mention the staff and be, have a great detail about it because he's writing Jesus as the Moses? This is an easy one that doesn't change our theology in great detail. But if you've read the resurrection accounts, it sort of seems like details are left out and details are presented a certain way depending on who's writing it and when they're writing it. So to say that all the history is there is a very slippery slope. Now, my inerrantist friends would say, John, but you've taken a passage that the details, we're, not, we're holding them to too high a standard. Perhaps. But if God wrote this specifically, he planted them in them and it, they were just manual typewriters, wouldn't they get this right? I know I'm at reference. I know I made reference to this in Sunday's sermon, and I'm using green and yellow behind me, so I know it's changed the background because I haven't adjusted the camera. But Peter ends, and lots of people who I was made to read in other environments have written about this. Books about how the Bible actually works, how an ambiguous, ancient, diverse book leads to wisdom rather than answers. If you made it through Sunday's sermon, you heard about the sin of certainty. That trust is an excruciating option. And a phrase that may sound familiar if you've listened to me preach, the Bible tells me so. Why defending scripture has made me unable to read it? Has made us unable to read it. We're spending so much time defending it when it was never intended to work that way. Now you may struggle with why the synoptic gospels have three different stories over the same event. I'm going to make a suggestion as to what that means from a terms of inspiration. Real quick, and I, as was pointed out to me, I didn't give you these percentage in the original thing. Apparently that's something I dropped from teaching this in other environments, but there's four basic views of inspiration. And almost everybody who expresses these views of inspiration picks one and ignores the other. Well, this is all the Bible is this way, and all the Bible is this way. Mechanical dictation, which I've already ignored and thrown out as a standard for all the biblical text, I'm going to propose to you quickly that some of the Bible is mechanical dictation. And the numbers you see up there, mechanical dictation, the way we used to teach it is, it's 99% God and 1% humanity. And the percentages you're going to see coming up are going to correspond that way. The first number is going to correspond to how much God is involved in the text and how much humanity is involved in the text. Um, examples of mechanical dictation. Well, what, what do you mean, mechanical dictation? Have you read, you know, maybe Exodus 20, verse 1? If you're not familiar with Exodus 20, it's where you find the Ten Commandments. The biblical writers say that God's finger wrote on a stone. I don't know how much more mechanical dictation you can get. So clearly that section of the biblical text is clearly written by God, clearly and henceforth by God. That's what I mean about mechanical dictation. We're not trying to dispute it, but just because part of the biblical text is mechanical dictation doesn't mean all of it is. Isaiah 38, 4 and 6 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says, And I have heard your prayers and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. Now, if you're familiar with the Advent narratives and the passages we used, that's an important text. But what I want you to understand is those are the words of the Lord spoken directly, and they're just quoting them. No different than when you took, went to school and you took notes when the teacher talked. The notes were 99% the professor, but 1% you writing them down. And related to this, any quote from Jesus in the New Testament is clearly mechanical dictation. Fully God, fully human is speaking words and we are writing them down. Okay? So there are significant portions of the biblical text that are inspired as mechanical dictation. So I just want us to see that maybe not all of the biblical text is inspired the exact same way. Even though it's all inspired... It's not inspired the same exact way because that makes no sense. And I don't know why we taught that for years. 
Let me just run through the other, th other three options of inspiration, and these aren't really in debate. The percentages are in debate. The names I'm using might be in debate, but these are the standard ways. There's plenary verbal. And this is what you hear most people when, they, when you push back against mechanical dictation. They say, well, we're plenary verbal. That means, I don't want to bore you with what it all means, but just go with the percentages. It's, it's mostly God, and they would raise the percentage probably higher than I have done traditionally teaching. That might make it 90% God and 10% man. Sure, there's some personality, in, but it's God's word. And this, these are the words that we want that God wanted said almost exactly the same way as best could be said based on the human limitations. And I would argue that a large portion of the biblical text is inspired that way. Now, you're going to see this gets tricky because that means I have to figure out how it was inspired and what it was intended to and what value it gives to me. I'm going to give you some things to work with off of that, but just get at the end. Third, we call dynamic. Um, there are lots of different terms for this. If you're on the more conservative side, you call this blasphemous. If you're not, you call this trying to be a realist. And you may adjust the percentages. I was, I was taught by someone in my first year of undergraduate college, someone who went on to be a head of a department at a major seminary and became a provost and has done so many things throughout their denomination. This is the percentage that I was taught. Um, I'm not arguing the percentage, but just to give you an idea. Dynamic are sections of the biblical text, not all the biblical text, but sections of the biblical text in which God influences it greatly, but the person's personality comes through. I would argue, as I have said when we talk about prophecy, there are aspects of being a prophet in which you do predict the future with very little details. But most of predicting the future or telling what's going to happen, you just look back and see what happened. You take the information you have and you tell it. Some of the biblical text, I would argue a significant minority of the biblical text, is dynamic because the writers of those texts or the people who are copying it down are doing nothing different than what I try to do to you preaching on Sunday morning. They're taking the information of the past, the biblical text, a view of the present, and saying, if these things continue, this is going to happen. If you want to stop these things from happening, you need to do this. And then there's Shakespeare-like inspiration, which I would argue is a very, very, very small amount of the biblical text, um, because Shakespeare was inspired to write what he wrote. There are arguably, though I will not get into it in this study, there are arguably sections of the biblical text that you could call Shakespeare-like inspired. They're really useful for us, but they don't carry the same weight as Jesus said, love your, love your neighbor. If you want to pick something, visualize the book of Proverbs and how it sounds more like a fortune cookie than you know, Paul describing theology in the book of Romans. I would give it a little higher inspiration than Shakespeare-like, but just if you need something, go with that. What we've taught traditionally, people who do what I do, we've taught you all the biblical text is inspired one of these ways. And of course, it's not Shakespeare-like, and it's not mechanical quotation, and those um, flaming progressives, it can't be dynamic, so it's got to be a plenary verbal. So everything that's there is almost exactly what God wanted. Good. And that's Okay. But you've now, for, you've now taken texts that are literally from God and you've diminished them. And you've taken texts that maybe shouldn't have the power that we've given it. And you've raised it up to be equal to the Ten Commandments. That's a dangerous, dangerous slope. Now, I know I just dumped a whole bunch of stuff on you. And for many of you listening and watching this later, that was brand new information. You've never heard this before. And I'm sorry if that seems difficult. But this is what we need to do. I'm going to try to give you some hints with 1 Corinthians 7. I don't know we're going to get all the way through it. I don't have a clock around me, but I don't want to, I don't want to lecture on for 50 minutes here in this kind of format. So let me just do this quickly. 1 Corinthians 7, it might help. Now, there's a quote that I pulled out from a very, very narrow-minded conservative scholar who's well-respected and consistent, but incredibly narrow-minded. 
Um, and he wrote about 1 Corinthians 7. He said, So despite the common assumption that Paul is just giving his personal opinion in 1 Corinthians 7, which I would not agree with, but let's, let's say he's just giving his personal opinion because some people say that. There are good reasons as a glance at almost any good commentary on this passage will show, that we should not take this instruction in 1 Corinthians 7, or indeed any of the teachings of the apostle, as somehow lacking in authority. What he's using language-wise is the problem of 1 Corinthians 7, which we're going to get a little bit of here in a second. He's trying to solve it with, I know it sounds like he's just giving an opinion, but really it's from God. And, and it's just kind of, he's just trying to use some language and say, well, you know, I didn't get this directly from God or I wasn't taught this directly, but logic tells me as a biblical apostle that they should do this. Okay, and there's some truth to that, so I don't want to diminish that too much. However, I do want to get to 1 Corinthians 7 at least to this first slide, and we'll see how far we get. 1 Corinthians 7, and somehow I was unprepared with having 1 Corinthians 7 ready. 1 Corinthians 7. Now, if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, um, the book opens with Paul being thankful for them and having hope in them, and then he talks about some things, and he mentions some things, and then he's pretty much for the next, what we know is chapter 4, maybe even chapter 3 we could include with the Cephas, Peter, Apollos thing. From chapter 3 all the way to chapter 14, he's just critical of things that they talked about, they asked him about, until he can talk about the resurrection, which is what he really wants to do. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, right at the beginning, I'm just reading from New International. Now for the matters you wrote about. So they asked some questions. I want you to visualize what that would look like in the 21st century. Hey, pastor, can you teach us something about the biblical text or teach us about a social issue? Which is what he's going to discuss, his social issue. What does the biblical what is the biblical text and what does God think about and just we'll just pick hot button issues for a second because these would be the equivalent in his time. What does the biblical text say about abortion? What does the biblical text say about same sex marriage? What does the biblical text say about, you know, dating? What does the biblical text say about, you know, who's too young to get married and when they're too young to get married and and how should family members handle, you know, step family and all of these kind of things? And quite frankly, when you ask someone who does what I do, some of, most of those answers are going to be very clear. And we're going to say, well, this is what we understand based on you know, scientific studies, sociological studies, and the biblical text, that this is what we believe. But there's going to be some, not we'll call it opinion, but some educated theological ideas. But whenever we do that as ministers, we should say, I can't tell you this exactly what we should do, but as best I can tell, we should do this. Okay. Understand, you would respect someone if they said it that way. They would say, this is what we understand, this is what we know, but this is what we get from the biblical text. So just so you understand that. Now for the matters you wrote about. So he's answering question. He says, I say this as, verse 6, I say this as a concession not as a command. So all of a sudden, Paul has admitted that this is not quite the perfect idea and may not be the perfectly inspired thing. And then he says, it's always a dangerous thing in the book of Corinthians when Paul says, I. He then says, I wish that all of you were as I am. So Paul voices that he thinks it's a good idea to be like him. But it's not a biblical command. It's not mechanical dictation. And that's what we need to understand, is a lot of things Paul says, as we're going to continue to look in 1 Corinthians 7, are powerful and inspired, and we should respect them, and we should apply them as best we can. But not all of them come with the same rigid, this is directly from God. This is as best I can tell what God would want us to do. Those are two different things. Those of you who are much better parents than me, you say to your children, these are the rules, and then you start using the phrase, I think it's okay for you to do that, but it's against my better judgment. That would be my suggestion what Paul's going to do in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, I'm going to pray now, 
And then we're going to pick this back up and I'm, because I know I've dumped a whole bunch of stuff on you. I'm going to pick this back up next week and we're going to pick up right at 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to go all the way through the chapter and we're going to try to look at inspiration and give you some tools to work with. Let me pray for us. Holy God, thank you that you are almighty. Thank you that you are my God. You are our God. You are the God. Thank you that you've given us the biblical text and you've given us real people at a real place at a real time that we can trust. But help us to read the text the way it was intended, not the way that makes it easiest for us, but the way that it was supposed to be. Forgive us when that is hard for us. Help us to continue in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone. I know it's kind of an abrupt place to stop, but you have been bombarded with a bunch of stuff that you may have to go back and double-check to see if that's what I actually said. We'll pick up here next week, and I'll see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.